Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. Today's lovely music is by artist Yakov Goleman from his album, Piano Album Number no. 1. See the link in the description for a link to where you can find this uh, wonderful music. This will be the fourth lecture in our wood design series. This video is going to focus on certain classes of defects found in boards. Specifically, we are going to look at the topics of shakes, checks, and splits. Um, this will be a relatively quick standalone video on the definition and origin of these particular wood defects of, again, ch shakes, checks, and splits. Let's see, so shakes, checks, and splits are related phenomena, each a certain kind of local wood defect, a separation of wood material from some cause or force. By local, this means they are located in a relatively small location on a board, in contrast to larger warping phenomenon, which you might refer to as global. Shakes and checks and splits are the separation of existing wood grain elements by some force. This is in contrast to knots and burls, where a defect forms in a piece of lumber as a result of a branch or nub interrupting the regular flow of wood grain as the tree develops. So in my mind, the main difference between these phenomenon and the video that we discussed and the topics that we discussed in the previous lecture are that uh, these phenomena, again, uh, shakes, checks, and splits, these form generally after the tree has grown while, uh, or after the wood material is formed, while knots and burls are formed as the tree itself grows from beginning to end. So uh, first let us consider shakes. Shakes are separations that occur along the wood grain, typically along growth rings. Uh, they can be seen as the separation of one growth ring from another. One thing that makes shakes interesting is that they are typically not caused, uh, in fact, by a drying or temperature process or temperature effects. Uh, this separation of growth rings is actually primarily caused by bacterial infection while the tree is growing. So um, after some material has been laid down, if bacteria ends up growing with the, uh, between two uh, uh, wood rings, you can end up getting uh, shakes forming in the lumber. So it's basically certain infections can damage the connection between growth rings, which results in separation of one ring from another uh, when placed under some sort of mechanical stress. So basically you end up with bacteria uh, forming the initial weakness, and then later mechanical stress actually pries those layers apart, perhaps during the milling process. Alright, so imagine for a moment that you have a tree. And as we know, trees grow from the inside out, and they, of course, have growth rings that are visible if you cut them in down perpendicular to the trunk. Now, of course, I am drawing this in exaggerated scale. In reality, the growth rings are, well, especially for uh, hardwood trees, are much smaller than this. But we'll go ahead and draw them so that the growth rings are easily visible. And uh, let's discuss the process of forming a shake. So as we mentioned, you can get, uh, you may get some sort of bacterial or fungal growth in between your growth rings. And uh, if, we are, if we say each growth ring is approximately circular, then we could say that this shake would run um, tangent or along each growth ring. And when you do get this particular bacteria in bacteria, you get this particular bacterial infection between the different growth rings, this then ends up forming a weak spot in the wood. And then, um, let's say you go and cut this. So let's, let's say later on we cut a board out like this, we may end up with something kind of like this. And you'd have your various growth rings. But because that weakness formed right when the tree, uh, as the tree grew, you may end up with this weakness in the tree that per in the, and then in the final lumber product. And if you then go and apply some sort of mechanical stress, for example, if you plane this particular uh, board down to, to plane it to a certain thickness, you may end up actually breaking it right there and then ending up with two distinct pieces of wood. So a shake is generally runs um, along a uh, growth ring and it can, it can basically run any direction in relation to a board, depending on which direction you cut the board. If you cut it this way, it'll run like this here. Uh, if you cut it uh, vertically like this, it'll be similar to this. But you could, if you cut it something like this, 
then you'd also end up then you'd end up with something where uh, the growth the direction of the growth rings actually changed in in relation to the direction of the board. So it somewhat matters what in what manner you cut out your pieces uh, cut out your boards from your uh, initial log. But uh, the key thing about shakes is that they are. Uh, the root cause of them is a bacterial or other infection, and they uh, they form uh, a long or parallel to growth rate. Also key is that these do run along the wood grain, so uh, this of course is viewed looking into the trunk of the tree, but if we were to then look, uh, say, along its side, we would see uh, this kind of, we would see, um, you know, for example, a tree trunk like this, and the, uh, the individual growth rings would be a series of layers going inward. However, um, these do extend in, these are not like a one-dimensional phenomenon. They are surfaces that extend into the, to the uh, grain, so the actual, or into the actual uh, trunk of the tree, or along with the grain. So if you have, you would have sort of a section, if you cut, if you were to uh, drill down, or imagine you were to take a tree trunk and sort of uh, put it on a lathe and like slowly thin it down. Eventually you might come to a layer that was uh, thin or uh, weak at a particular location where the shake had formed and that would run both uh, along the grain but also uh, along with the uh, growth rings of the tree. Uh, checks are another phenomenon we should look at. Checks also occur along the wood grain and they run perpendicular or through wood growth rings. So again, shakes typically run um, along growth rings while checks run uh, radially. They run perpendicular to wood grains. These form primarily as part of the drying process after a tree has been harvested. So a tree's tissues like those of animals carry a lot of water. When the tree dries or is harvested, it slowly begins to dry out. This process can be accelerated by kiln drawing and a few other processes, or a few other techniques. Checks form as stresses are introduced in this drying process, especially as a result of uh, rapid kiln drying. So uh, next, let us consider checks. Well, let's go ahead and draw another lovely tree trunk. And we'll just draw our exaggerated growth rings again. Something like this. Okay, so uh, if you've ever handled green lumber, uh, you may have some experience with this. And and that is that, uh, well, if you have some experience holding both uh, green lumber, which is lumber right after it's cut down, and say uh, lumber after after it's been milled, after it's been dried, after it is ready to, for, to, for actual use, say, in construction or some other uh, field. Um, and one thing you immediately notice is that green lumber is very heavy. Uh, dry lumber is much, much, much lighter than green lumber. And we will eventually talk about moisture content, and I'm going to give that its own dedicated uh, video. But um, the and I'm not going to get into the exact definition of moisture content. There's actually a technical definition that's a little bit different than what I'm going to talk about here. But if you look at the just water percent by weight, you can easily have um, trees or, or logs or boards or whatever that are two-thirds water by weight. I mean, it, trees again are living organisms, or they start out as li living organisms just like we, just like we are. And just like uh, the human body is va has a vast majority of water, uh, trees, like really all living things, though they may look, uh, you know, hard and dry on the outside, on the inside are actually very wet. Um, and so they can easily end up with uh, you know, two-thirds or more of their weight being water, depending on the species and the age and a lot of other factors. So, um, now, before we typically use lumber, however, we want to dry it, and that serves a variety of purposes. One, uh, dry lumber is a lot easier to work with because it's not so heavy, that helps a lot with transportation and uh, the cost of lifting lumber, machining lumber, all that stuff, but more importantly, uh, dry lumber is going to be a lot more resilient to things like rot and bug infestations and other things. So we typically want to dry our lumber out uh, to below a certain moisture content before we use it. But think about how we actually dry this out. So if I have a log that's say, I don't know, like six or seven inches in diameter, if I want to actually dry this out, how do I do that? Well, um, I'm not gonna like try to, I mean, if, if I wanted to get like a really even drying, I could, for example, maybe like I don't know, try to stick some like pipes through the thing and like try to stick some pipes all the way through the thing, like um, something like this, maybe like 
do something really crazy and expensive like drill a whole bunch of pipes in here and then like inject conduit or put conduit um, all the way through the log and then run some sort of uh, run some sort of warm water or something through there through the tubes to like increase the temperature all the way through the log and then drive off moisture that way but that would be very elaborate very time consuming and most importantly very expensive so we don't do that instead what we do is we just heat them from the outside so what we're going to do to dry a log is we are going to apply temperature now, there are other ways to dry uh, things out. For example, you can use, um, in certain lab settings, you might use vacuum drying, which is exactly what it sounds like. In vacuum drying, what you do is you, uh, in vacuum drying, what you do is you um, basically put the, put the uh, material that you want to dry in a vacuum chamber, and then you go and uh, suck all the air out of it, or most of the air out of it, and that can result in samples uh, drying a little bit quicker, but more importantly, it preserves the microstructure a lot better, which is, um, so sometimes this is used for studying of wood microstructure and concrete microstructure and other things like that in lab settings. But for any kind of large scale construction, it's typically not gonna be that practical. So instead, um, you know, cause vacuum chambers that would hold the quantity of lumber that we use every day would be, um, quite a, a burden to say the least. So instead what we use is we use um, temperature. So we'll go and uh, basically um, we'll apply temperature to the to the tree. We, this might be, now this can be done a couple ways. There is kiln drying where you actually, uh, you know, place the um, logs or boards in, in literally basically an oven and you heat them up to a couple hundred degrees and you just directly drive off the moisture that way. And that is used for a lot of mass production uh, construction lumber. But there's also air drying, which is often preferred by uh, people doing like fine uh, woodworking, uh, fine furniture making, that sort of thing. But um, the uh, good thing about uh, kiln drying is that it's a lot quicker. The downside of kiln drying is you get a lot more thermal damage to the lumber, uh, like the checks that we're gonna discuss here. So what is the problem with rapidly drying wood? Well, uh, as you might expect, okay, think about this. Again, we cannot heat this thing all the way through all at once. If we want to drive moisture off, we have to first heat up the outside. Um, and then we, so we first heat up the outside, that heats up just the outside. Then over time, the heat slowly works its way in. And in turn, as the heat slowly works its way in, the water slowly works its way out. So heat slowly works its way in and water slowly works its way out. So this driving off is ultimately like, it's ultimately kind of a uh, osmosis type process. So um, water leaves this layer of wood because it is wetter than this layer of air that's immediately next to it. Again, water leaves this layer of wood because it's immediately, because it's drier, or because it's, I'm sorry. Water leaves this layer of wood because it's a little wetter than this layer of air. And then um, water leaves this layer of wood because it's a little wetter than this layer. Water leaves this layer of wood because it's, it's a little wetter. It's a little wetter than this layer, and so on. So what you end up with during the drying process is something like this, where if you could plot the moisture content of wood versus the, actually it'd be the opposite way. Sorry about that. Um, kind of the exact opposite of what I drew there. If you were to plot the uh, moisture content of wood versus the radius, you'd get this kind of relationship. So on the outside, you'd, during the drying process, on the outside of the wood, which is very close to the uh, source of heat, or if you're using a kiln drying, or the source of, or the outside uh, environment, which you, if, if you're doing air drying, all you really do is keep it uh, in a dry building or something like that, where uh, the outside air doesn't have a very high humidity. So, um, the outer layer will ha will very quickly gain a moisture content very similar to the um, very similar to the outside air, but the inside will only very very slowly decrease its moisture content. You have this continuous increase going inward and a continued continual decrease going outward. Now, eventually, once it's fully dried, you'll end up with equilibrium all the way through. But it is, drying is not an instantaneous process. 
Uh, again, if you were to do something crazy like, you know, drill a bunch of holes uh, through um, through a, a tr tree trunk or through a log or whatever and, you know, run a warm, a dry air through those or something, I suppose then you could actually get it to dry relatively uniformly, but uh, that is uh, difficult to say the least. So uh, next, let's look at how this causes uh, checks. So let's go back to our log and again... We'll have a series of growth rings here. So the first thing you have to know is that when materials dry, tip or not all materials, but at least with wood, when wood dries, it shrinks. And later, when we we'll, we'll actually talk more about moisture content and shrinkage directly. But um, the key thing to keep in mind right now is that as wood dries, it shrinks. So initially, if you have something, you know, if you have a square of wood like this, when it's fully wet, once you dry it, it's going to shrink a little bit and end up something like that. It decreases, well, I drew that, that as, I drew that as an area, but in reality, it actually shrinks in volume. It's that if a, a cube of wood at one moisture content decreases to another cube of wood, a smaller cube of wood at a lower moisture content. So, um, if you remember from, say, think back to maybe like mechanics and materials. If you think back to mechanics and materials, you may remember a topic um, or whatever class you learned material properties in. Uh, you may remember a concept called um, thermal stress. And what that is, is a stress that forms in a material uh, through thermal pressure or from uh, thermal expansion or contraction. So say you have, let's look at a pure, a more uh, kind of just idealized example. So let's say you have a beam that's that's between two rigid supports. So again, this support and this support can't move, and you have some beam in the middle that's made of some material that is deformable, can feel stress, can feel strain, etc. Then what you do is you go and apply heat to this. Well, uh, when things heat up, they want to expand. However, this particular beam is, is restrained, it's locked in place, it can't expand. So it wants to expand, but in effect, the walls are going to, it's basically it wants to expand outward, but in effect, the walls are going to force it back inward. So a compression stress develops on this and uh, from the support, basically this is the supporting force uh, from the supports or from the walls preventing the beam from expanding. And the opposite will happen if you cool the beam. So if you have this beam and you chill it down, oh, well, actually, maybe do, I should have done blue for, there you go, I like that better. So you go ahead and apply some uh, cold air, cold water, or something to the beam. You chill it and rapidly lower, the, or its, temp and rapidly lower its temperature. And what this is then gonna wanna do is, it's going to want to shrink but it won't be able to because its ends are restrained. So it's going to go into tension. So think about that in the context of the log. Now, um, this is not exactly the same because uh, we're not dealing with thermal stresses here generally. Now, I guess you can get some of that during the drying process. If, if, you have a, if you have a very high temperature kiln, you can actually get some sort of thermal cracking, but most checks are actually caused by uh, moisture effects alone, but it is a very similar mechanism to uh, thermal induced stresses. So let's look at maybe just a wedge of this. Let's look at just a single wedge. Let's say a wedge of a particular tree ring was initially this size. Then, as it dries out, it wants to shrink. So it, it tries to do sort of, oh, maybe something like this. It wants to shrink. Like this. To a slightly smaller wedge, maybe something like this. Now, that's all well and good. Um, however, well, actually, let me, um, let me, I think I can make this a little bit better. What it would really like to do is something more like this. It would like to shrink to a wedge like this. However, and again, and if the whole tree had shrunk uniformly, it would be able to do this. However, in fact, it's not able to do this because it is still restrained here. 
let's say that it's only cooled down through, uh, maybe it's cooled down through part of it, but it hasn't actually cooled, uh, not, sorry, not cooled down. Let's say it's lost moisture uh, through part of it, but it hasn't really lost much moisture at this surface here. So this surface is fully, has its moisture content fully lowered, but this surface has its original moisture content. So this surface has, actually let me just, let me draw this a little bit better. This surface has in fact shrunk, but this surface is still at, at, its, at its original size. Something kind of like, oh no, I don't like that. So, something kind of like that, and like that, oh. and like that. So again, here, it's at the size it wants to be, but here, um, oh sorry, actually more like, got that a little backwards, here, it is at the size it wants to be. Maybe I'll highlight that in a different color. Right here, it's at the size it wants to be. It's uh, the whole growth ring around the tree is shrinking at the same rate approximately. So it's able to shrink just fine with its uh, you know, neighbors to the left and to the right along the growth ring. However, look here. At this location here, there's a difference. It would like to be where the, it, basically, it would like to be the, where the red line is, but in fact, it's stuck at the blue line position because this inner ring hasn't shrunk down yet, and it hasn't shrunk because its moisture content hasn't really decreased much. So the red line is where all of the wood would like to be, and the blue line is where it actually is. Again, the black line is where it started out, the red line is where that entire section of tree would like to shrink down to, and the blue line is where it ends up shrinking under a partial shrinkage condition. So. Um, again, on the inner ring, it doesn't shrink much because it doesn't, uh, it, th th that inner ring there hasn't actually lost much moisture. So you end up with a, out here on the outer surface, you end up with, uh, basically the wood having the, the shrinkage level that it would, that it wants. And then on the inside, there is, uh, very little shrinkage. And then the difference between the, uh, outer surface, which has a lot, because of the difference in the outer surface where there's a lot of shrinkage, and the inner surface, where there's very little shrinkage, you get differential movement, or more, or more precisely, you get you get constrained stresses. So what ends up happening is you get tensile stresses. You get tensile stresses kind of like this, and you get them because um, drying is not a perfectly uniform process. I I drew this as happening kind of like a. Uh, kind of like a wedge, but in reality, it's sort of a continuous process going all the way through the tree trunk. So in reality, if I were to draw what a tree trunk actually looks like under a rapid uh, high temperature drawing stress condition, what you end up with is something like this. This uneven drying process ends up forming uh, radial cracks in the log, cracks that are perpendicular to the uh, that are perpendicular to the growth rings of the tree, going into the tree trunk or into the um, into the uh, tree well into the tree trunk into the trunk of the tree that run parallel to grain. So these cracks will run both uh, perpendicular to the growth rings and parallel to the wood grain, and we refer to these as checks. Checks again are th are um, thermally or more commonly uh, moisture drying related or moisture decrease related uh, shrinkage cracks resulting from the drying process, and that fundamentally is the simplest explanation of what a check is. Uh, splits are another type of phenomenon, and uh, checks typically occur as an entire uh, log is being dried, but or, or an entire large section of maybe a post or something like that is, is uh, being dried. But splits typically form in individual milled boards. They can either occur, they, they occur either as a result of mechanical stresses from uh, milling or drying stresses that occur in a board. Splits typically extend from one face of the board to another face and can run either directly across or at an angle. 
However, depending on how the tree growth rings align with the board's cross section, the split may pass through or along growth rings. Finally, let's look at splits. Now, splits are something that usually occurs after a board has initially been milled. So when you initially mill a board, you try to mill it, you know, and plane it and etc. as straight as possible. You try to, uh, you know, cut it with your uh, sawmill as straight as possible. But, um, so now this is just my uh, poor hand drawing skills, but let's say that's a perfect rectangle. Um, but when you go and mill it, sometimes later distortion does occur. So let's say after some distortion, your uh, board, which initially was perfectly rectangular, was maybe distorted a bit in this kind of shape, kind of an arch shape. And that, that's called cupping, and we'll discuss that in, in the next video, actually. But uh, let's say then you have your cupped board. And this is definitely an exaggeration. It's not, you know, ever this cupped. Um, at least I hope not for any kind of lumber that someone would uh, consider using. And, oh, for... Uh, for reference, this is looking into the, this is basically looking at the end grain. So you might have actual wood grain on the rings if this was, uh, if the pith was right here, for example. The wood grain might go something like this. You're looking um, into the wood grain here. And more realistically, it might be something, well, it's still not very realistic. Realistically, maybe you're looking something more like this. And that's still a very large amount of cupping. Okay, so um, what happens if I then want to thin this out? Let's say I decide this particular board is too thin, and even though it has a small amount of cupping, I try to um, feed it through a planer in order to lower its thickness. Now, the way a planer works is there are two cutter heads, one on either side, and you use that to both flatten and also shape a piece of wood. Uh, you basically put it um, end grain into the planer and you trim it down to a certain level of thickness. Now, uh, it will tend to, it'll basically apply a large amount of force and induce com and basically compress this thing uh, to try to make sure, it, and it does that to make sure it has good contact and it also uh, just to make sure that it has a good grip on everything so that it can resist the uh, forces generated by the cutting process. Now, um, as it applies this compressive force, what will tend to happen is it will tend to uh, want to compress this here back into this kind of shape here. Um, so uh, after after some cupping or some warping, again, it's adopted this shape, but as it goes through the planing process, it's forced into this shape. So let's think about what kind of stresses are going to be introduced here. Um, this, uh, let's look at this here. Um, this surface, if you think about this, is going to go into compression. If we want to, if you want, if we want to change this shape into this shape, this bottom surface is going to go into compression, and this top surface is going to go into tension. Because again, as it goes through the planer, it can't really go through the planer as this kind of arch shape. In order to go through the planer, it needs to be forced by the just the compression force of the rollers into a more even thickness rectangular shape, more or less. And there's a little, this is definitely exaggerating quite a bit to, for the sake of illustration. But um, what's going to happen here? As this side goes into is, goes into tension, as the top side goes into tension, and the bottom side goes into compression, well, you can end up forming a little split there. And in fact, that's what we call it. We call it a split. If you've ever seen a split in a board, that's one thing that can typically cause it. So what you end up with with splits is a board. Um, again, it's basically been cracked by some force introduced into it during the milling process. And so you end up with something, um, a board with basically a crack running all the way from one surface of the, um, all the way from one surface of the board to the other surface of the board. And it goes all the way from one surface to the other because it was formed during the milling process of a single board. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, also we mentioned that it can occur either, um, really with any relation to the direction of the grain. And it really just ultimately depends uh, what the relationship between the orientation of the board and the grain direction is.
So if you go to a lumber yard and you, uh, or just even a big box store like Home Depot or something, you can find uh, wood with all sorts of different, uh, you can find boards with all sorts of different grain directions. Like if th this is still looking uh, into the end grain, you might see some like this. You might see some more like this. And you might even see some, oh, uh, for a particularly uh, for a particularly wide tree trunk, if a board was cut sort of horizontally and almost um, almost tangent to a tree ring, you can actually get something kind of like this. So whether the actual uh, whether the split ends up going perpendicular or or parallel to the growth rings is ultimately dependent on just how the particular uh, that particular board was cut. And also, depending on how the grain uh, works, the the boundary between the between the wood grain layers or the boundary between the tree rings is always going to represent a weak point in the tree's strength. So, um, with something like this here, you might just get the, probably the easiest way to cross this is just for for a crack to just go directly across, just kind of directly across like that. Whereas if you have something like this, um, it might be a uh, well, I, I might say energetically favorable, because ultimately cracks and things like that are a force and energy process. It takes on a certain amount of energy um, for a crack to form in wood, like in any elastic material. And so um, basically where a crack will form is going to be dependent on sort of like, uh, as you form a crack, you're shattering and breaking material, and that takes energy. And the, the, where a crack will form will basically be the path of sort of minimum energy. And so if a crack finds that, it, that it's easiest to form kind of like this, that's what it will do. Um, when, when the uh, tree rings are going parallel like this, it wouldn't want to like come here, come down, jog over, and then come back down. That's usually not going to happen. But if you have a growth ring that's kind of sloped like this, or if you have one like this, the crack can end up actually uh, following the wood grain. Uh, or following up the wood grain, I should say, the tree growth ring. Because again, tree growth rings tend to represent slightly weaker spots in the uh, wood grain or in the board's uh, overall uh, cross section. And so as a crack is forming, if it can form, um, if it can deviate partially or entirely uh, along a crack, or sorry, along a growth ring, it will do that if it is energetically favorable. So again, the actual uh, path a, um, a crack, or in this, what the formal name we're talking about here is a split, the actual path that a split will take is very difficult to predict. It's a combination of really how, uh, how the tree, uh, the individual boards were cut in relation to the growth rings, the exact details of the thickness and the strength of the growth rings, all these things. The key thing to keep in mind for, for uh, splits is that they are formed by stresses from the milling process and they almost in all cases will go from one surface of a board to another surface so the actual path can vary significantly depending on the properties of the wood. Anyway, that's all I wanted to discuss today. I just wanted to do a brief introduction to three common local types of wood defects. And we'll come back to uh, these when we discuss how the NDS and other codes ha handle wood defects in the design process. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you want to see more of my work, uh, please feel free to subscribe and uh, like to make the robots happy. Finally, if you would like to help make content like this possible, see the link to our Patreon in the description of this video below. Uh, regardless, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it a little bit interesting. I will see you soon for the next video, and as always, thank you.